Check, check, just testing the audio. Check, check, just checking to make sure that the audio is okay.
Okay. Um, okay, so good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone else. Uh, my name is Donatella Della Ratta. <laughs> I am uh, a professor here at the uh, Communications and Media Studies Department at John Cabot University. We are extremely proud uh, tonight uh, to kick off with the new season of Digital Delight and Disturbances, uh, which is our signature lecture series uh, uh, engaging with uh, aspects of the digital critically in a critical way. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about the Fall 23 lineup. Uh, so tonight, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker in a moment, uh, but I just want to say that uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday, October 24, we're going to have uh, Milagros Micheli talking about there is no ethical AI without ethical data work. And then uh, uh, two talks uh, in November, Anna Engelhardt and Mark Cinkovic, uh, talking about fear of the wrong image, the new politics of evidence, and these are a Russian and Belarusian <coughs> artists engaging with uh, fake news uh, uh, and online verification systems. And, and last but not least, Ukraine TV on uh, November 13, talking about uh, the art of war streaming. So this is an incredibly rich uh, lineup for this season, uh, which uh, we're gonna kick off tonight uh, with uh, Paolo Cirio who's sitting here right next to me. Um, Paolo is an Italian uh, artist. We are happy that he's back to Italy because uh, uh, he used to live in the US for a long time. Um, Paolo is an artist, but he's also an activist. So he engages his practice, uh, uh, engages with uh, uh, different aspects of the digital in a very critical way. And actually his work has uh, challenged also uh, big corporations uh, such as Google, Facebook, uh, and also big uh, institutions such as NATO. But he's gonna tell you more about this. Uh, I, I just wanna leave the floor to Paolo and say that he's gonna talk for about 45 minutes, uh, something like that, and then we're gonna open up to the Q&A. Uh, I know there are people watching us from uh, YouTube, so please, uh, those of you who are watching us from the tube, if you wanna send us uh, um, questions, do so in the chat. And uh, yes, now I leave the floor to Paolo. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, thank you so much, Donatella. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for everyone uh, that uh, is here for um, attending this lecture. It's a very pleasure, I feel kind of home because as Donatella said, uh, I was living in the US for more than 10 years and uh, this university is right in Italy, and so it just feels uh, strange, but at the same time, very comfortable. A lot of works they will present tonight actually will be about the US context, so it's actually very great to have uh, an audience like yours. Um, nevertheless, uh, I am Italian. Uh, my name is Paolo Cirio, I am an artist, but as Donatella said, I am also um, an activist, and I also write quite a bit about theory, media theory, and actually also curate uh, some shows. And uh, I want to start with this, uh, which is also um, about the context of this invite and my presence here because uh, Donatello organized this symposium about uh, evidence and art. And uh, this is a essay I wrote and it's also a show uh, that I curated. Um, which is uh, this idea of this form of art. So I am an artist, uh, but what you will see is uh, on the edge of art. Um, while I can definitely contextualize my uh, practice in this idea of realism. And so the idea that today uh, reality is very um, complex and very uh, fast, and it's hard to see actually, and it's hard to intervene in this reality. Um, and people are also very confused about that. So uh, artists like me today have this tendency to try to puzzle together uh, this uh, shattered reality and try to give, make sense of it. Um, and eventually also intervene, and that's actually my particular, uh, let's say, aesthetics. So intervening it and eventually trying to inspire change. Um, so that's actually how I am um, engaged in art and active, hacking quite for a long time, and some people call me uh, art activist, if you want. 
And so I am engaged in uh, akeratics, and akeratics is quite broad. It's like about uh, digital rights and digital rights about uh, privacy, surveillance, but also goes to uh, uh, digital economies and, um, and uh, politics and so on, and we will go through all of it. And nevertheless, by being a hacker, or at least trying to um, engage in being a hacker, I also investigate its own aesthetics. So there is an aesthetics about being a hacker and uh, actually are very similar to what really happens uh, for real hackers, if you want. Um, so we will go through that, and we will go through that uh, uh, within a history, so um, well now we are uh, more than 20 years of history for the internet, things changed very rapidly, um, and so also our understanding of the internet, the way we use it, how people use it, is very, very different. And um, well, I was lucky enough to start very early, so it's like uh, now 20 years of, um, of work, um, and, um, and so also the idea of internet freedom has been changing. So um, one of the pillars of internet freedoms are freedom of speech, freedom of access, and freedom of privacy. But I would say uh, that um, you know, in, 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 in the 90s, or at, until uh, mid, uh, um, uh, I mean beginning of 2000, uh, the, the internet freedom was uh, mo mostly concerned about copyright, surveillance, disinformation, manipulation, censorship, abuse. So a hacker would be engaging in fighting these things, even copyright. Uh, today is much more complex, and here is a, um, a list of issues that uh, we have within the internet, within the technology, and we talk about a lot about ethics and technology, ethics of AI and ethics in uh, robotics and so on. So it's much more complex compared to um, from where I started from. And um, from where I started from, and let's say also the history of, of hacking in, gener in general, is about cyber wars and cyber protests in a way. And so thinking about internet as a weapon, but also internet to disrupt, to block or, ma or manipulate information. And so historically, uh, hackers like me, uh, especially the first uh, sort of art and hacking, uh, were engaging in this uh, practice called the DDoS attack, civil disobedience, digital civil disobedience, uh, which was sort of a, a, a way to uh, use internet to make protests. Um, and in particular, I started to work on this practice uh, around 2001, and this is one of the first projects I want to present, also because we cannot avoid to talk about war uh, in these days. Um, this project was launched um, actually right before 9-11, and I kept working on it for quite a few years. And as you can see, it's a website uh, uh, discussing or uh, talking or criticizing the NATO. So the context here was, of course, the wars in Iraq, the wars in uh, Afghanistan, and just the aftermath of the, uh, the wars in, uh, in the Balkans. So NATO was considered, um, especially for activists, a sort of like uh, an institution that has been to be discussed. So this was actually just a blog, but back then, uh, blogs were just about to start, so now we are really used to this idea of like citizen ju journalism. But actually, citizen journalism started uh, uh, before blogs were actually a medium. And one of the first uh, of those mediums were uh, these indie media networks, which was a, a network for activists all over the world. I think actually started uh, from San Francisco and then expanded. And so I was sort of using this network, so being part of this network was very decentralized, uh, to uh, organize these cyber attacks against NATO. So this is particular, uh, for instance, a banner that I posted um, on this uh, indie media uh, website. And so uh, through doing these attacks against the website of NATO, eventually I could gather people and try to take down the website of NATO. I cannot really claim that I took down the uh, website of NATO, although back then was quite possible, but definitely that was already a threat, especially back then. So for instance, this is a, a publication uh, from uh, a military um, 
um, publisher that uh, mentioned these cyber attacks that it was organizing. And actually, this was uh, this also saying that uh, this would have been a threat for a space uh, military mission, which is uh, quite uh, far in the future. But anyway, that's already something that uh, was uh, relevant. So anyway, uh, by um, publishing news against the NATO, of course, uh, at some point, uh, Russians started to try to infiltrate me, or they started to um, be friendly to me, let's say. So um, this is an email I received uh, in 2006, was actually already at the end of this project, from this guy called Leonid Savin that really pushed me to publish something that he thinks is very relevant against NATO. And um, of course he said uh, is um, information about NATO, Ukraine, and so on. And um, well, I was a little bit suspicious about it, so I didn't publish it. And um, also because then, already back then, I figured they was connected to this guy called Alexander Dugin. So today, Lenor Savin, back then it was just a random guy on the internet or someone that was already connected to that world, but not that clearly. So today is a um, member of a military scientific society of the Ministry of Defense of Russia. And Alexander Dugin is still considered today the ideolog ideological brain to the point that uh, the doubter was killed in attack just a few months ago, just after the start of the war. So just saying how these things can evolve. But this for me is an important example also because for me that was the beginning of understanding information on the internet, internet in a very dif different way. Because back then the idea of uh, conspiracy theories the idea of this information wasn't what it, it is today, you know. So we could just read stuff on the internet, on the newspapers and so on, and trust that information. We didn't have that knowledge of thinking, oh, this is probably not real, how can we double check? And especially uh, Russians back then already figured that those conspiracy theories could be constructed in a way that could be uh, quite uh, credible in a way. And so that's also when I stopped that project because I couldn't fact check everything I was publishing. That, that portal of news about NATO had already 900 articles after six years. So I couldn't figure if everything was correct. And uh, so I decided to stop. Um, but 2006 is also the year of WikiLeaks. And so I don't know if you heard about Julian Assange and Charles Manning, probably, yes. That was also a very important moment uh, for, uh, I would say, uh, the notion of information and the notion of data, the idea that uh, we take for uh, granted that, or we take for truth what is published uh, in those sort of leaks. Even the idea of leaks actually uh, became popularized through WikiLeaks right in that year. And um, while we all know, um, what happened with Julian Assange is uh, still like uh, in the limbo legally. And Charles Manning, which was actually the leaker, the whistleblower, uh, this um, very young um, queer girl that decided to uh, give a huge amount of data, leaks, documents, secrets uh, of, about the US military to Julian Assange that published on the WikiLeaks, which was actually a, a portal, a website. And that created, a, for, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, created a huge scandals uh, throughout all the, um, well, all the systems uh, related to the US military. So I jump directly to another uh, topic about internet freedom, which is copyright. So copyright also has been changing somehow in the, in the general understanding of the internet or in the general understanding of um, digital information. So uh, since a few years ago, uh, hackers like me or activists, digital activists like me would fight copyright. Copyright was a limitation uh, to accessing information, to accessing knowledge. So we wanted to break down that. And so in 2006, I hacked uh, Amazon, um, this was done uh, with the uh, other two artists, but the hacking was uh, actually created through um, an algorithm that they coded uh, in 2006. Back then, Amazon um, 
was actually just selling books still. <laughs> it's not like today that you can buy anything. So Amazon was just like pretty much selling books and especially um, in the other uh, Amazon. There was not even like Amazon Italy. There was probably only Amazon Germany back then. So anyway, um, back then was also the moment when Amazon started to uh, scan and digitalize books. Uh, also Google was starting to do that. And there was this kind of striking uh, cultural moment in a way when publishers were freaking out and saying, no, what happens if you digitalize my book and everyone can take it, read it, they don't buy the, the printed copy. And so Amazon was just at the beginning of that and they, was they were starting to convince publishers to digitalize everything. Somehow there was a bug in the system of the first books published digitally on Amazon and was possible to steal the entire content of books. That's what I've done digitally. And then I was reprinting them. Well, first of all, giving access uh, uh, as PDF to everyone uh, online. And then uh, I was also printing them for, for an installation. <clears throat> and that actually became, let's say, escalated this idea of free access to information and also the question of copyright. So I don't know if you heard of uh, Aaron Swartz. Aaron Swartz did the same, uh, but at the MIT library, actually the MIT uh, publishing house with all the uh, journals uh, that MIT ever published. So quite a number, now I don't remember exactly. He was not uh, lucky uh, as many others in a way because they accused him of stealing and breaching the security of MIT systems, basically the library, and so he ended up in a very difficult lawsuit that never ended, he, and he unfortunately he killed himself. Because back at the time, the criminalization of repression of hacking was pretty heavy. Not that today it's not, but there were several gray areas, especially how far you would go, go if you were an activist or you were like a public person and so on. So let's move to um, 2011 and, um, and then the rise of social media, a very difficult, a very different new chapter of the internet. Uh, this project is about Facebook, of course, was done also with uh, um, Alessandro Ludovico, which is another Italian artist. In this case, I coded uh, this algorithm that uh, harvested over one million profiles from Facebook, uh, random people from all over the world. Um, and then uh, I created this huge database and uh, I processed this data with uh, artificial intelligence to extract their name, their likes, and especially their face and their facial expression. Back then was really the first implementation of this technology. And they published everything on this dating website. So all of a sudden, all these people were found on this dating website, real um, names, surnames. And as you can see, already um, a kind of like a characteristic that uh, the AI inferred on uh, in this case, a sly woman. And so you can see the picture, the original picture and the one cropped. And then you see also some sort of data mining. So similar people, actually 800 people that are French or sly and likes some particular things. So there was already some data mining. This of course was uh, a huge scandal. Uh, it created a, um, uh, a viral news, we counted over a thousand uh, press uh, all over the world in a week, in any kind of language, in any kind of medium. Uh, of course, also because everyone wanted to check if they were there because the news itself was sexy. Uh, to the point, though, that, um, of course, uh, Facebook sent um, a legal letters and actually, uh, still mentioning the same law that they mentioned before, this famous US Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And uh, well, then uh, Facebook asked that uh, we would stop, do immediately whatever we were doing, 
and uh, also giving back all the data that was stolen. This still this idea of that data is something physical. You would give it back, and um, and then yes, destroying all the code in any sort, and um, and nevertheless never use Facebook ever again. So <laughs> completely banned from. So they took down immediately the our our profiles. Um, these are these complex projects anyway they're also shown uh, as installations so you can see uh, the website some uh, press uh, coverage and then uh, I don't have unfortunately the detail uh, of these um, this central piece and these are uh, just faces of people organized by their facial expression um, these refer to a big scandal about Facebook, though, that was revealed much later. Uh, the first time was 2015. I mean, Facebook had several scandals, actually, even before 2015. Uh, but this probably was the beginning of something much bigger in 2015, because this was the first time um, a United States politician used the data harvested from millions of Facebook accounts. And then the 2018, scandal which was connected that revealed that uh, 87 million Facebook user data were uh, stolen from Facebook and then used to target voters. Uh, this actually was uh, used for during the um, Trump elections. Um, so we can see that how what they was doing actually was in a very smaller, smaller scale compared to what actually Facebook was doing in a much bigger scale, in a much bigger uh, abuse um, to the point to use that data to uh, manipulate the elections in the United States without, of course, asking permission to everyone. This is the biggest scandal, but you could imagine how how many times Facebook sold the same amount of data to a private company, whatever it was. So this was actually the, 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 the worst of the companies because Cambridge Analytica was um, engaged in uh, manipulating um, the political elections. But we will go back to that. So let's do another jump. Now we are in 2013, and um, in this case we are talking about well, finance, actually. 2013 was the aftermath of uh, Occupy, so the Occupy movements that started uh, after the financial crisis. Um, and so we are talking about Wall Street, and maybe you still remember people camping out outside of Wall Street, the famous Occupy movement. So this project happened very after that. In this case, <coughs> I managed to hack this website, which is the website of the Cayman Islands. So Cayman Islands uh, is pretty much like Switzerland, at least for European, is the similar, the closest example. Uh, but actually for the US, Cayman Islands is the Switzerland of the US. It's particularly connected to the US. So Cayman Islands is this small island close to Cuba. You probably know where everyone goes to for holiday for the beaches, but it's actually offshore center, meaning that very wealthy people go there to hide their money and to not pay taxes. Because if you can say that you are a resident of the Cayman Islands, you won't pay any taxes. And nevertheless, you can be completely anonymous, meaning that no one can know that you're actually there. How do they do that? Well, first of all, uh, this was, was the website back then in 2013, although it looks very kind of like a, a website from the 90s. And, and that probably why, that's also the reason why it could be possible to hack it. So you can search for basic things like birth, death, marriage, and the Cayman Islands, but then there are like these uh, kind of like weird buttons, say Cayman Incorporation. So those buttons are the ones I hacked. And that, that led me to reveal for the first time over 250,000 companies incorporated in the Cayman Islands, meaning that for the first time, the list of all the companies incorporated there were public. But that wasn't enough to me. I wanted to push the provocation further, and I republished all this data on this website that I made, loopholeforall.com, where everyone could buy one of those real companies in the Cayman Islands for 99 cents basically trying to democratize offshore finance, letting everyone to avoid taxes and um, for a very low price. 
Um, so people could just search for a name of a company, a real company, and uh, buy, um, I don't have this, buy a certificate, a digital certificate, but could also print it uh, out as well. And with that certificate, that is a sort of ID, a passport for, um, for a company, uh, you could invoice in your own country and say, look, I have a company, Cayman Islands, that's how I invoice it, and so I don't pay taxes. If the taxman uh, or the IRS, in this case, uh, would ask, well, let's see if you are really the owner of this company, and they had to go to the Cayman Islands and ask, who is the owner of this company? Cayman Islands, by law, would say, we cannot tell you, it's completely anonymous. So in a way, was reversing the main feature of Cayman Islands against themselves. Um, and so, doing that, I created a scheme that allowed me to do so, which is also the scheme that those companies used. So, usually those companies are not only incorporated in Cayman Islands, they're incorporated in many jurisdictions uh, to just try to hide and make their liability even more difficult to trace back in a way. So in this case, it was based in, uh, in New York. That was my headquarter. And to sell those companies, I opened a, a, another company in London. And then uh, I was sending those certificates through paywall, uh, PayPal that is uh, at, in Luxembourg. So the money would go directly to the US without even going to London, by the way. And nevertheless, my passport, so this part of the installation, there is actually a print of my passport, so I am an Italian citizen. So from the Cayman Islands, which is the jurisdiction where I committed the crime, they had to look for me in New York, but they couldn't really do anything because everything was published through this LTD company in London. Uh, LTD stands for limited liability, basically. And nevertheless, uh, the money was flowing through pay, PayPal in Luxembourg. And all the data that was stolen was published in California, uh, which usually is very friendly to keep online uh, this kind of like controversial kind of information. So these are, this is part of the installation with all these documents, because the documents here, uh, those printed letters, even if we are living in a digital world, uh, are still very important, especially back then, now a little less. Uh, so this was working pretty well until PayPal actually uh, sent this letter uh, saying that um, I wasn't allowed to sell, um, they say, illegal content. So this was kind of the first pushback uh, of, the, of, the, of the project. And then I started to receive some sorts of um, uh, emails from random people, uh, very, um, upset uh, that were actually real owner of companies. So it started with very small ones, also actually the ones that they wanted to put their name forward because uh, the mafia didn't write me, because the criminals didn't write me, because if they write me, I know their name, they expose themselves. So in a way, this was also a checkmate for them in terms of like when you want to remove or saying something to me uh, for, about this project, you expose yourself. So in this case, it's just someone say, fucking hassle. But then also I started to receive these letters that are much more um, formal, and this is an interesting one. I received more than 40 letters like that. Basically, they asked to remove their companies from this website called Loophole for All so that no one can steal their identities. And it's interesting because at one point I start to receive this letter from multinationals, and be a big bank. So this is actually a very huge bank, and it's actually the bank uh, um, holding the debt of Argentina. Uh, so the interesting thing that it comes from uh, one Wall Street, so definitely from Wall Street, and the letter is sent to London. So it's, not, it's to my company in London. So it's kind of playing this kind of role uh, between these jurisdiction and places. Um, so this is the, the entire installation where there is uh, some of the companies, because 250 are quite a lot, and, um, and, then, uh, and then the scheme, and then the, um, the actual certificates that at one point I started to give them for free because I wasn't allowed to sell them through PayPal, through PayPal 
uh, anymore. And then screenings also of interviews that I have done with experts in this field. Uh, well, that later on became such big deal because there were way more uh, leaks around this uh, uh, financial secrecy. And so the famous one was the Panama, of, uh, the Panama Papers. Panama, as you know, is uh, not far from uh, uh, Cayman Islands. It's also another huge um, offshore center. And so this was probably the one of the biggest leaked, at least until then, uh, about one, uh, 11 million leaked documents. And so this created a huge uh, kind of like uh, earthquake uh, all over the world because they found out a lot of politicians had a, uh, a company there, a lot of companies, uh, multinationals, and so on. This actually was the first of several others, Paradise Papers, and so on. Also, there is the Vatican Paper, which is less known. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely something that happened around that time. So let's move to another project. I am going pretty fast. There are so many other details for every project, and they are not all the projects, but they are all complex, so I just move fast. Uh, we are in 2015, and uh, we are back talking about privacy, but in particular talking about surveillance. So uh, this project is called Overexposed, and it has to do with the big scandal of Edward Snowden, which is actually an American, um, uh, well, I, I would say he was working for the CIA, for the intelligence, US intelligence, and at one point he uh, just dropped a huge leak of document, documents showing that the US was involved in a huge, uh, system to surveil every citizen around the world. Um, and so he, he actually, he actually uh, published documents about NSA, CIA, and FBI. And um, that was quite uh, overwhelming uh, back then to get to know that uh, uh, the Americans were basically, or at least the US intelligence was able to surveil everyone uh, without, disc without discrimination in a certain way um, and, um, and in a very invasive way. So my response was actually to expose those people that were behind those programs, which actually are directors. I mean, those systems are agency, US agencies that are run by people that take decision and run those program or plan those program. So in this case, I wanted to expose them uh, in a very simple way. Everyone could do it, really. So I started to monitor the social media for anyone that was posting a picture of those people. So in this case, for instance, was the director of NSA that randomly um, met this guy, probably it's like a, in a football match or something, and this guy take a selfie with him and post it on, the tweet, on Twitter. And so right away I find this, this picture and I made it uh, a street art project. I started to paste his face, his selfie uh, around London, Berlin, New York, Paris, all over. Same with this other guy. This is actually one of the most popular in this sort of scandal. Uh, General Kit Alexander, he was also the NSA. In this case, uh, the picture was made by this lady, again, another selfie, and uh, she posted it on her Facebook. So I find it, and I make of him, uh, of his selfie, uh, this um, street art piece. And eventually also make a big painting that looks like a pop painting, pop art painting. And um, so bringing these figures from the dark, the secrecy, and making them a sort of like pop celebrities. And so those paintings also circulate in museums, in art fairs, and they sort of like get always more exposed. This is a famous one. Um, this was the director of FBI, J uh, James Comey, uh, until, I mean, uh, I think it was Trump that fired him. But this, these people are still active, so you would find like interviews with him still now in these days. So in this case, it's also even funnier because the picture was made by a sheriff. So he's like in a green room of a conference, and, um, and this sheriff just take a picture of him without his permission with this kind of like so sad face. And also in this case become a poster that they paste all over the, um, the walls. 
and uh, in a painting. So I moved to another project also about uh, privacy, uh, really a question of uh, privacy in the US actually. Uh, this was a project I worked on for quite a few years and I, I, was, I launched it in 2016 and I, f I think I ran it until 2019 or something. And it's obscurity. So in the US, you probably know, it's very easy to get arrested. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sometimes for even a mistake or sometimes for a very little thing. Um, and it um, has been very bad now, maybe it's getting a little bit better, but not really. So every time someone gets arrested in the US, uh, there is uh, data that is produced the booking data if you want, the criminal data if you want, and they take the mugshots, right? The famous mugshots. That kind of information, that kind of data is considered uh, public because it's produced, created by the government if you want. So it is uh, in the public domain. Uh, however, that means that everyone can use that picture, that data, and do whatever they want. And that's what happened. There is an industry of mugshots website um, that republish that data. And we are talking about a dozen of millions. Uh, they say there are like more than 80 million mugshots in the US, which is, I don't know, three times it or something like that. Two times probably now. Uh, so in this project, what they've done, I collected the same data from those sites, over 10 millions of those mugshots, and then I republished them on a, a website, a mugshot website, actually six, Mugshot website, it looks pretty much the same. So I cloned the real Mugshot website, but I blurred all those pictures and also shuffled name and surname. So that when you're looking for someone that got arrested, uh, a serial killer or uh, someone that smoked a joint, you won't find that person, but you will find like uh, uh, blurry pictures and name and surname that don't really match with anyone. And so that's actually what happened because I published all this kind of noise information on the internet pretending to be those mugshot websites. And as soon as I started to do that, I started to receive a lot of emails from people that had those problems, had those mugshot exposed, and uh, actually couldn't move on in their life. For instance, this, I just wanted to uh, pop up this, uh, this um, this one, actually the second one, because the second one is this um, college student that is looking for um, getting an admission um, in something else, I think uh, actually in another college, and is very concerned about the fact that his picture is still there and he doesn't know how to take it down. And uh, so these people are asking me for help, are explaining me their stories, this is actually a nice story compared to other ones because of course when someone got, gets arrested sometimes it's a very tragic moment. And actually this was actually very heavy when I started to receive all these emails. Um, but that let me start a campaign to uh, create a privacy policy in the US that could allow citizens to remove that kind of information uh, because of course whatever, even it's like um, in the public domains, is an invasion of privacy, especially considering the problem of mass incarceration in the US. Uh, you can imagine the US in a small town, in a small county, wherever a cop arrests you and maybe writes something random on the computer and that piece of information remains on the internet forever. So that is definitely a problem for a lot, a lot of people. So this, um, this campaign was run uh, for quite a bit, and so it also, it also started to be a community of people uh, working together, and uh, I had to push it quite a lot. And now things are a little better, but not really, I still receive some of those emails. Um, these, though, um, made someone unhappy. So the real owners of one of those mugshots website, actually the most known, mugshots.com, uh, wrote me one of those uh, letter, legal letters as I saw, I show it before, which is, <laughs> is very common in uh, some of my projects. Um, and in this case, of course, they are saying that uh, I am stealing their traffic, I am hijacking their traffic because uh, people instead of going on their 
website, they go on my site, and they say that if I don't stop, they will bring me to court and so on. In this case, I didn't want to remove anything, also because a week after, they got arrested. <laughs> so this was a funny story. And these are the two owners of, those, of that important, um, famous website, with their mugshots, of course. <clears throat> this, uh, this was the, a particular situation around that time, 2016, 2020. Um, so the campaign I was uh, advocating for is actually in Europe exists as a privacy policy that's called right to be forgotten. And in the US, there was a, a quite a bit of push against that idea. So the fact that everyone, I mean everyone, citizens could remove information from the internet. And it was also the time when some people in the US were also thinking that revenge porn should have stayed online. Even if you think in Italy, revenge porn was uh, regulated not that, time, not, not that long time ago, probably five years ago or even less and was also the beginning of the notion of fake news and, uh, well, also deep fake and, of course, disinformation. So that's what I was really talking about. That was uh, this campaign, right to remove.us, that was the campaign I was running, was this idea that not everything should have stayed always online. Uh, something that actually was an idea that was against the original idea of the hack hacking culture, hacker culture, um, and in, in particular some figure like John Perry Barlow uh, that um, had this um, idea of this, uh, the absolute freedom of cyberspace, going back to this idea of internet freedom. So what's internet freedom really is not anymore this idea of absolute freedom. And this idea of also techno-libertarianism that still exists in the US, and you would often hear um, from San Francisco and the Bay Area, uh, especially in these days with AI, and the idea that AI shouldn't be regulated, um, or yes or not, also in the cryptocurrency uh, field, and so on. Um, and so this was a very particular moment because these people had to step back and say, well, maybe actually not everything should be online. And that was also the moment when Trump was using Twitter as a main medium uh, for whatever the propaganda he was uh, doing, and when Twitter didn't want to block him. Um, and they actually blocked him only after he lost the elections. That was a very interesting time in this idea or this notion about freedom and um, whatever can be published or not, which is still around. But it was interesting because was the debate was happening right there. And also Alex Jones that actually is mentioned here because he was, um, he was actually active uh, already during the time that I was running that website against NATO, and he had this uh, website called InfoWars, and he was also like actually uh, informing about wars, and then I don't know if you know the story of him, he was the, the guy that was really pushing for uh, conspiracy theories, the Pizzagate, I don't know if you heard of the Pizzagate, he was the guy promoting Pizzagate. Um, so um, that's what happened, and um, and now I am going back to this idea of, um, um, well, more than data, we are talking more about uh, algorithms here and the AI. And we are also going back to this, uh, um, this uh, scandal of Cambridge Analytica, um, and which was from 2008, 18, around 2018. So I want to present this project uh, which didn't create a lot of reactions, to be honest, but it's quite interesting in the context of the history of the internet. Uh, because in this case, I managed to collect over 20,000 patents of internet technology uh, from uh, 2008 to, to 2018, so 20 years. Internet technology is actually algorithms, but also interfaces, even the buttons that you push are patented. And uh, there are a lot I discovered, and in particular I wanted to focus on the ones that were designed to manipulate you, 
or surveil you, surveil you or uh, discriminate you or polarize you, control you, or make you addicted or, um, this, or for deception, manipulation, censorship, and so on. So there were quite a few, and they are, they are quite intense. So for instance, then I started to select the ones that were uh, the craziest or the creepier, if you want. So in this case, for instance, it's like this uh, algorithm that tried to uh, identify people having social, uh, socially unacceptable beha behaviors, whatever it means. And so once I found them, I printed out and I started to paste them uh, or tape them in the major colleges in the US where those patents are made and actually where those patents should be regulated if not even banned. And these in instances like uh, Harvard College and so um, students of Harvard uh, for a few days could find those patents in their campus. This is Stanford and this is a patent uh, for, um, it's a technology for deep targeting advertising based on social behaviors. And advertising, of course, can cover quite a few products, including your vote, eventually. Uh, this is the MIT, is actually the AI department of MIT, so where really AI is created in a way. And this is a patent by Facebook that is trying to determine um, how much money you have or how much money you make. And based on that, you will see some information or you will access something um, based on your income. Um, and then it could go forever. There are hundreds. So I just want to show a couple, probably more. So this is also by Facebook. In this case, is trying, uh, is using facial recognition, not only to recognize uh, you or your close friends, but whatever is happening in the picture, whoever is actually in the picture. So even if you don't use Facebook, Facebook would analyze your face and would um, identify you. There is even one that's um, trying to find your cat, uh, the table, the chairs, whatever is the context, visual context in the picture you post on Facebook, but also on Instagram as well. Uh, so this actually is a book, uh, it made a, a coloring book, so to basically kind of educate in a way on those patterns. There are 300, uh, some of the, 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 the closest uh, final selection I got. And those, there are those uh, installations where the walls are full, so it's like this kind of feeling, uh, overwhelming feeling of being controlled, manipulated, surveilled, and so on. And so there are also like these huge installations of meter and meters. So I go to a more recent project. We are finally in 2020. Uh, this was a very successful project in uh, my terms. Uh, capture. And uh, so in this case, we, I used facial recognition again. Uh, 20 years later almost, so now it's very powerful, very accessible to everyone. And I used it with on the on the French police. So basically, I collected uh, uh, public pictures of police officers in France. Just going on Google and typing "police France uh, uh, football match, uh, soccer match, or protests in Paris, protests in Marseille, and so on." So I ended up to collect uh, hundreds of those pictures. And then I asked to some French activists in France to give me the pictures they take during the protest, right? Uh, which are quite a lot. So I ended up with a thousand pictures uh, like this one, and then I ran facial recognition on it. So as you can see, now you can find any kind of faces, even a small eye in the picture. So I ended up um, with uh, 4,000 faces of police officers that they published on this website they made, capturepolice.com, where everyone could type the name, identify uh, the police officer, basically crowdsourcing the identification of police officers, which make it very dangerous for them because once uh, I know their name or anyone know the name and uh, the, the biometric, um, details of the face, then everyone can make an app going around Paris and find police officers during the day, wherever they are, shopping or anything. 
So uh, this was a huge threat uh, for the privacy of police officers. And if that was enough, I also printed some of those pictures and I pasted them uh, around the city center of uh, Paris. Um, and then I made this huge installation um, where there is a, a selection, um, I mean a selection, 150 of these faces and, um, and some, some videos and so on. But this escalated very quickly. So in France, uh, there are strong unions protecting uh, police, if you want. Uh, and then so after some police uh, unions protesting against this project, uh, things went all the way up to the interior minister of France uh, that tweeted that uh, I should have stopped immediately to do this project. And um, also, because otherwise it would have brought me to court and would have been quite tricky to get to court from the interior minister. And also he asked to um, remove, actually to deprogramming, if you want, the exhibition. So that installation that was here actually wasn't never shown. And this is actually people covering the installation that was about to open the week later. So basically an act of censorship uh, by the government of France. Uh, nevertheless, the project was uh, done to promote a campaign that they launched to ban facial recognition in all Europe. Um, so it was kind of like um, a contradiction in a way because on one, on one side I was saying, uh, well, we need to use facial recognition to identify police and eventually stop police brutality in France, which is pretty bad. And the other end, I am saying, well, we, no one should ever use facial recognition. But this was actually, they were helping each other because the idea was showing that facial recognition is so dangerous that it's dangerous also for the police, the ones that actually want to use it and keep it legal. And so the campaign went uh, on, so it was actually quite a bit of research also in this case, and, um, to, and I, I ended up collecting more than 50,000 signatures uh, uh, of the petition for banning facial recognition in all Europe. And so I sent all these signatures to the European Commission um, with my policy proposal, privacy policy proposal, and the European Commission re replied me always with this nice formal letter saying, oh yes, you are right, uh, facial recognition in Europe is not uh, regulated enough and we should do something. So this was um, all the chapters very briefly around uh, internet freedom. And now I want to move on to another chapter um, of, um, of work um, that uh, is the current one, and which is actually about climate change. Uh, so uh, lately, uh, since three years, I find uh, the climate justice issues quite interesting. Uh, because there is much more data around it, and especially, well, the emergency for it, and also the question of um, visibility, secrecy, evidence, and literacy, which is actually something I've been working on on the internet, and nevertheless, <coughs> the global politics of it. So I launched this project called the um, the, the, the climate tribunal, so I was lucky enough to use this building that allowed me to launch this uh, idea of the climate tribunal, international climate tribunal, accusing fossil fuel industries. So you probably have, uh, you, you are familiar with, this, uh, with the climate lawsuits, so maybe you heard of that, this idea that uh, the fossil fuel, fossil fuel industry is accountable for having caused climate change and bringing them to court. So I started to uh, popularize uh, data about those companies, fossil fuel companies, um, basically uh, really showing that today we can, um, uh, we have the evidence to, uh, to really make them accountable and showing how much, um, how, how much emission, uh, greenhouse emission have been uh, emitted over the years. So this is a, like a spreadsheet that is painted uh, with the actual data, uh, which was shown in that exhibition. And uh, these are the ones I accuse in the tribunal, uh, which are the culpable. And so this is a flag 
with actually a logo of uh, Shell, uh, but there are many others, um, at least 100 companies uh, emitted for more than 70% of greenhouse emissions. So there, there are really a few. And then this question of secrecy, that's actually uh, quite important and interesting, and also this question of evidence uh, around climate change. So these are graphs that uh, uh, were actually produced by Exxon in 1982, so more than 40 years ago. And those graphs come from internal studies of Exxon uh, to kind of research what their products would cause 40 years later. So those graphs somehow were kept secret for 40 years. So Exxon actually produced those graphs with their own scientists and internally, and they kept them secret. Those graphs are incredibly accurate about what we are experiencing today. Somehow those scientists were so good that they knew exactly what was going to happen today. Uh, meanwhile, though, Exxon actually for the past 30 years was engaged in uh, uh, disinformation and uh, manipulation around, the, uh, around the climate change. So this is an interesting question about their accountability because they knew and they uh, manipulated information and keeping secret the actual um, evidence. So those are paintings now, uh, very, very, very bright colors, as you can see, to bring attention to that. Uh, this is also the case of Shell. Uh, Shell, uh, slightly later, in 1988, did the same, and actually they were even more uh, accurate in a way, because they even studied the ocean acidification and the uh, increase of temperature by latitude. In a, very, in a very accurate way, so it's actually what happens today. Same story, they kept it secret and they kept um, spreading misinformation about climate change. And then there are other graphs that actually how much money those industry made, as, uh, as you can imagine, huge. And the fact that they, there is even the salary of the CEO and so on, also the banks that invest in that, and the fact that they never spend uh, any of those money for reparation. More evidence, of course, satellite pictures um, about what's really going on. Well, now, this was like already three years ago. We don't probably don't need the satellite, satellite pictures anymore. So, and um, all those evidence are brought to court, to the tribunal, um, to defend uh, the ones that are actually um, uh, subject to climate change. So these are, these are, these are the, um, the plaintiffs. Uh, some of the plaintiffs are the species that are endangered by extinction. Uh, as scientists say there's over a million of those species. So in this case, I also aggregated data. I took data uh, about 40,000 species that are uh, endangered by extinction. And then I made this uh, website, Extinction Claims, and it's actually an installation where um, the, the species are um, basically um, complaining to, uh, well, in this case, to the European government that uh, there's those major fossil fuel companies should pay for preserving those species that are um, going to uh, disappear. So this is a huge installation with all that data printed out, or at least a little bit of data printed out, so there is much more. And uh, all of this to get to the current project I am running today, which is Climate Class Action, which is actually a campaign I am running mostly in the U.S., focusing on the U.S., uh, which is something I am doing from here, though. Uh, for this is, as you can read, a uh, climate class, and uh, probably as Americans you know exactly what is a climate class. This is pretty much the same. So everyone can um, um, ba basically calculate their personal damage from uh, climate change. Not really, but from fossil fuel companies. So if you lost your car, if your house was damaged by a hurricane or a wildfires, you can type here how much you lost, maybe how much was worth your car or your house, and you would know how much big oils company owe you. They have to compensate you. And uh, through that, I am also trying to organize for real a class action, 
um, basically it's quite a bit of work, uh, especially in uh, uh, strategizing the communication. So in this case, I am trying to have like a bipartisan campaign, so bringing together all American citizens uh, so they can really run. And this is actually slowly working out because now there are really real law firms that are actually pretty interested in supporting this. So eventually this might become bigger. So I guess this is all, and we are opening for questions, and we can talk more about everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Paolo, for this amazing uh, overview of your work, uh, which is really amazing and uh, thought-provoking. Um, also, I, I want to make a point because it seems to me that 20 years ago when you started working on these issues, like the, the main issue at stake was to have less regulation. In fact, you quoted uh, uh, John Perley Barlow, this idea that the cyberspace should be left free from intervention. And it seems to me that now we are in need of more regulation, right? <laughs> Indeed, it's yes. It's a paradox. Indeed, but that refers to everything if you think about deregulation. Neoliberalism is based on deregulation from after teacher government or Reagan government has been all about deregulate the market. And um, since last five, 10 years, there is a push for regulated uh, because we, we, we pay the results of everything. Amazing, I wanna leave the floor for question. Hi, uh, well, first of all, um, I wanted to thank you so much for the sort of historical overview or the lineage um, that you brought up, because I think it was really gorgeous to see it from your perspective and how it connected your work to sort of the overall uh, flow of what's been going on in the past. Um, I have two questions, um, um, among others, but I wanted to ask first uh, regarding your uh, project with blurring of the Mac sheds. Um, it sort of, you know, pop up into my mind uh, the whole notion of the poor image, uh, mm -hmm. and I would very much be interested in your take on the notion of the blur and the notion of noise in terms of the use of data sets and the use of images, um, and how we can sort of re reuse the notion of the noise to somehow combat the way that the AI companies are, for example, using the same data sets like the Maxes to then train their models. Um, mm. So I would be interested in your take on that. And then um, one other thing, uh, I also wanted to pick up on, on the point of Rosita Larata uh, regarding the copyright, uh, exactly that we have all of those sorts of images, all of that content, also the, the comments on the internet that are now being sort of taken away from us and um, commercialized and commodified by the big companies, uh, also with the generative AI. And so, so what is your take on, on that and how we could, you know, whether the regulation is the right way to go or perhaps some sort of more um, gorilla takes would be better. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the first question I would say really depends. I mean, for me, blurring or the poor picture is more a strategic uh, more than aesthetic kind of, I mean, if, if strategy is aesthetic, it's a question. <laughs> but definitely, definitely it's a decision I take or I think about when I publish that sort of data or use that sort of data. So in some cases, yes, I create that noise, that blurness, in this case to uh, protect the privacy or some people. In some cases, actually, I want to make them high definition because they want to expose that information and they want to make sure is um, very, um, uh, well, double-checked. I mean, double-checked is like a big word because it's such a big data, but making sure it's accurate. Um, and actually, in a way, that project of obscurity with the max shots, that was the point. I mean, the fact that they, data is not accurate. And eventually, if it was accurate, which is also very hard, but let's say that one day will be very accurate, but uh, anonymized, then yes, maybe it can be useful to prevent crime. 
Why not? Because in that huge amount of data, you have, unfortunately, serial killer if you want, or maybe some people that, yes, maybe you need to keep an eye on. So, of course, society is made out of that. But if that data was accurate, accurate sorry, and uh, anonymized, then eventually can be useful. So in that case, I wouldn't blur it. But I had to blur it because it wasn't accurate, it was and that was creating huge problems. Um, the other question, oh gosh, I already forgot. Um, help me a second. The On the copyright. Well, the copyright, yes. The, well, that's an interesting question uh, because that's one of those things like this information or like the right to remove information that really changed uh, over the years in the history of the internet or information technology because of course I am very in favor to the fact that those big companies should pay a royalty fee to the creators and not just exploiting that material. Uh, but it's a very different situation now because uh, that content that's out there on the internet was created by us and that's what they are stealing, they are stealing from us while back then the content was actually created by big companies or actually was a content that was already supposed to be in the public domain like libraries or books or, or like in a certain uh, way. So that's I think is the difference, yes. I, I just wanted to add something on this very point because I, I want to remind uh, uh, us that uh, we started this lecture series with uh, Larry Lessig, who is the founder of Creative Commons, uh, mm. and who happened to be also my boss when I used to work for uh, Creative Commons as uh, head of the Arabic-speaking community. And uh, when he came here, which was 2019, uh, we asked him, uh, okay, so wh what's your take now on copyright? Because so mm. many years have passed uh, since uh, Creative Commons uh, was born. And he said, well, if I think about, you know, and we were already in 2019, uh, which looks like ages ago, but the thing was that already uh, companies such as Microsoft, for example, had uh, scrapped the web, mm. taken all the content that was published under, for example, Creative Commons by, which is attribution only, what, one of the most lenient uh, licenses, and used uh, those data to train the AI for eventually, you know, selling the AI to repressive countries where the AI would be used for facial recognition. Mm. So it was like, you know, it, it was very sad and he said, this is like the betrayal of the commons. Mm. Um, and this is exactly what was happening. Uh, uh, the work of uh, Adam Harvey and other artists, uh, activists, uh, uh, who created the, the ex exposed the MS uh, celeb data sets right. kind of exposes this, yeah. right? Yeah, but what I usually say, because uh, I show you at the beginning that slide with all those issues of today's concerning information technology and ethics, quite a, a long list, and there is also copyright in it and piracy in it. Uh, to me, you can see at those cases only if you look at the context where they are. So, you know, I mean, the copyright is not good if the publisher is taking advantage of the authors. So in that case, eventually, maybe you have to break that kind of like whatever, a paywall of the copyright protection. While, of course, it's a big company taking advantage of artists, smaller artists, is very different. And there is so much complexity today that you cannot say, okay, copyright is good or copyright is bad. You will always have to put in context and considering what's really going on. Even one, even now that eventually AI will, uh, open AI will pay you and giving you a fee for having used your picture, how much is that fee? Is fair enough? You know, like we don't know yet. So we have to na analyze everything in that kind of context for sure. It's much more complex, so. Um, yeah. If, uh, well, I, I'll keep going, but please feel free to interrupt me. I, I, I would like, uh, Paolo, to, to talk a little bit uh, about uh, evidentiary realism. This was an essay that we used also in uh, some of our classes uh, uh, when it comes to visual culture. And I, I, I actually would like you to talk a little bit about also your practice uh, as an artist, because in that essay, Paolo argues that uh, today, if you want to strive for realism, you should combine uh, 
a set of different skills, including uh, coding, uh, including uh, inve investigative journalism. So you cannot just be the artist uh, who is isolated in the ivory tower. And I think that your work uh, shows it uh, pretty mm. well. So I would like you to reflect a little bit on this uh, concept of evidentiary realism and uh, the way in which it unfolds in your practice. Yeah, well, um, I think you related uh, actually uh, in that essay, I also mentioned one, uh, one other essay that really talk about the use of the internet to reveal sort of um, evidences, evidence in a way. So it was actually very related to uh, the hacker culture or the internet, the idea, the original great idea that the internet could be used to access any information by anyone. And by accessing that information, you can build knowledge. And that knowledge is um, eventually providing truth. But that was original, the original idea, and then we know what happened. So I think the, the idea of evidence in general uh, for artists in evidential realism is um, something that speaks by itself in a way. There is such strong a piece of information that in whatever context you put it, it will always communicate truth, which is something, if you think about the, the notion of scientific evidence, is very common. Uh, so um, uh, scientists would do any kind of trial uh, for years. They, would, uh, doing, you, they could do like any kind of like, uh, experiments, and then they would bring you the scientific evidence. So when they bring it to you, of course, gravity is gravity. Whatever you want to say about gravity is there, and everyone can prove it, and they can show you that it's always going to be there in any context, you know, any situation, any time. So that can be applied to also information if you have enough tools to prove that that evidence, that piece of information is always real. But those tools need to be very complex because, of course, not gravity is just a piece of information. But we do have those tools today, a little bit of uh, computational power, a little bit of uh, critical thinking that we didn't have before, for instance. I mean, critical thinking is something that also developed over the centuries. And then we also have uh, eventually the legal systems uh, or anyway, all the literature about that. We have the science of ethics, for instance, that we didn't have before. So we have quite a few instruments um, that allow, if we want, to actually prove that information is real. And that is something that uh, we, of course, we should uh, think about for the future, especially considering that we will have so much, inf always more information, and uh, most of it won't be that reliable. But we do have the tools, I think, eventually to make, uh, to check information and make it reliable and make it, making it a piece of, um, of evidence. Going back to the idea of uh, evidential realism, that's what I think it is. So artists, they really want to bring uh, those evidence uh, that speaks by themselves. So sometimes they're just objects, sometimes they're just documents. Uh, actually just prints of documents, so it, I cannot show you the, the pictures of the show, but probably also what I've shown you, uh, these, uh, when there are those big leaks, uh, those leaks are usually exposed in a way that want to communicate to you that that's the truth, and that's the truth that is revealed in a certain way. So I think that's kind of like the, um, the tendency by also several other artists, and I think this is like uh, something that's actually growing. Also because in the arts, uh, literature and so on, yes, of course, there is still fiction. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, especially um, an audience of an exhibition or, uh, or so on uh, wants to not be uh, confused by the artist. So if you want to enjoy audience actually, the, what is the taste of the audience today reflect a little bit what the artists really want to show in a way. So uh, the audience also want to uh, discover an exhibition by learning in a way. That's why when you go to museums, often these days uh, you have a room where there is a kind of a documentary even, or there is the kind of research based uh, kind of work. Uh, so I think this is actually a tendency that's growing. Yeah, that's the idea. 
Yes. Hi, thank you. I was wondering if you could elaborate more on what you were saying about disinformation. Uh, I'm particularly interested in climate disinformation and, and how much it proliferates on social media and, and is creating, um, as Steve Bannon would call a flooding the zone with shit so we don't know what's real and what's not. Mm. And it seems to be, in a certain way, a form of psychological warfare. So I'd be curious to hear your, any proposals you have about how to deal with the, the amount of disinformation that's out there just circulating freely in a fairly frictionless environment, such as in yeah. X Twitter and th places like that. Yeah, well, uh, I can tell you because by running this campaign, I am noticing something and I can also compare it to the history of this disinformation about climate. Well, now the problem is really Elon Musk, actually. Uh, that um, if you look for anything about climate change on uh, X or uh, Twitter, uh, you would only find misinformation about climate change, which is actually very shocking because <laughs> at the same time, there's been like a quite a push for regulating that kind of misinformation about climate change. So for instance, like Facebook has been forced or they say they do because they believe in it, they have a, a committee of, um, of filter, like checking all the information about climate. And I don't remember the name, but it's like a very special program within Facebook. They do only that to make sure that what's published is, um, uh, uh, I don't know, real as much as, so that they can take out all the misinformation. And then there are also like lawsuits looking on in that for social media. But Elon Musk said, okay, do whatever you want, and I am actually trying to uh, spread misinformation. And, um, and that works. I mean, of course, we can also talk about Fox News. They're still doing it. Uh, that works for the moment. I think in the next years, we will see such increase of t facts about climate change that will be harder to deny it. Uh, but that works, in fact, there are some states t uh, stats that says that Americans believed more, uh, they believe in climate change more 10 years ago than now. So that misinformation is actually working. So there's, there's, been, there's a long history. So for instance, uh, uh, George W. Bush, uh, when he was elected, he was actually, he was also elected because he wanted to regulate uh, greenhouse emission. And he was a Republican. And then after he got elected, the first six months, he was lobbied and then he changed the deal. But just saying that uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, climate change, people would agree on climate change in a, um, in a broader sense, um, also from the right to the left. And now instead that the people are very uh, polarized and of course they believe in stuff that is, uh, yes. <laughs> but that's, that's, that, that's the thing because the, 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 the media platforms allow that and they are not regulations in place, tools in place to stop that. I mean, would be just enough to like stop Elon Musk doing it, you know? For instance, would be already something. Okay, okay, hi, so I have a question. Um, have you ever done any work on the targeting, well, on the visualization of the targeting or profiling of um, marginalized communities or marginalized individuals through the surveillance of our and our great functions and if so or not like what are your thoughts on this um, I think uh, well there is quite a lot around that also considering now these um, this question of biases in AI systems is very well discussed so you would find uh, a department or an academic work in every college in the world uh, looking only at that. I also believe, unfortunately, that there is also like a lot of like uh, theoretical talking about it. And my experience, my idea is more the fact that you also should look at the actual streets, the real life world. And that's actually what I experienced with that project of the criminal data because you can theorize about biases and uh, discrimination uh, and so on, but in the algorithmic uh, kind of those things, but actually that happens already in everyday life. 
and that's actually from where those kind of discrimination come from. And uh, so I think there is, um, there is also some question that should look more, look more into the details. Uh, but yeah, of course, it's a, it's a big issue. Um, you were saying how the mafia had once contacted you about one of the things that you did. And there's also a bunch, like there's a long list of companies and governments that you've gone after. Have you ever felt threatened to the point of wanting to, you know, drop it and not talk about the issue anymore? Oh, uh, well, yes, <laughs> well, it's stressful. It really depends. So usually those letters are, those formal letters that I was showing you, those are called cease and desist letter. And so lawyers, they are supposed to send that before bringing you to court or starting lawsuits. So it's basically it's a warning. And usually when I get those warning, I stop. And that's what keep me safe. Um, the only time I didn't was the time when they got arrested. At th that time, I actually thought this is so bad that I don't want to stop it, I want to push it. And, uh, and then they got arrested and so I got away with that. But that was probably the, the highest risk I took around that. And then yes, get a little bit tricky, not really about the big companies, but when you get those personal threats. So I also received that threat uh, or like um, very strange ones saying, oh, we are going to find you where you live or those things. And that's what scares me the most because there is always crazy, crazy people out there that you don't know how they react. And so that's kind of like sketchy, uh, but usually I always try to be careful not like uh, uh, saying where I am <laughs> or like uh, or where I live, those kind of things. And usually probably also because those are short performances that where I don't push it too much and I retreat quite fast, they save me. But for instance, with the French police, I received quite a bit of uh, strange threats. And um, you know, maybe it's not the police, but there are the ones that lie the police that are also violent people. And they have, uh, maybe they are literally fascist, which in Europe is a, <laughs> is a problem for real. So yeah, that was, uh, that was scary. Um, I wanted to ask if, given that we have so much information and we're exposed to so many issues now around the world, um, and you do this activism projects through art and exhibitions, can we still enjoy as a society, should we still just enjoy art as art and the beauty of art, or should it always have some sort of political activist intention behind it, given mm. how many issues we have right now or we're trying to solve at the moment, if that makes sense? Well, I mean, there is art and art, not everything is political. Now there is a lot of like political art. Nevertheless, I don't think art is completely neutral. <laughs> so I think uh, the general understanding of art is like, oh, it's all good and uh, nice and pretty and uh, so nice and you can change the world with art. But actually the art world is kind of like pretty abusive and corrupt as also it's like as a cliche, but it's true. So I don't think you can, um, you can process all those issues, all this uh, difficult world we have today only through art, because eventually it can be also an artist that might confuse you even more, you know, <laughs> or is even more corrupted than the issue they want to show you. So unfortunately I would say it's also, it's difficult to answer that question, for sure though, there is that tendency, the fact that art today want to uh, be research based, uh, there is all this kind of like a question about uh, inclusivity of the arts, trying to reform the art. So that's a good sign. If we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would be in a very different situation, just like pop art, uh, uh, very only wealthy people, no woman at all, no people, not artists of color at all, which, bring, which means you don't have their voices in the room. So it would be much worse. So I think it's getting better, but the structures of art are still the same. So it's meaning that 
you know, museums or institutions, like for instance, the censorship in France shouldn't ever happen in that way, right? But that's like a, that's a stream case that actually happened in much more subtle ways in every museum and every gallery and so on. So I would say yes, it's great art as a medium uh, to bring up those issues, to understand those issues. But at the same time, you also need to understand what's behind sometimes because sometimes it's also tricky in that way. So yeah, I mean just uh, the critical attitude to everything including art, definitely. I think, Paolo, we can call it a day. Thank you, a big round Thank of you. applause for uh, Paolo Cirio. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you to the Media Lab uh, Com Department and uh, all of you who have been with us today. And uh, stay tuned. The uh, next talk is on October 24 with Milagros Micheli. There is no ethical AI without ethical data work. Thank you. Nice. Thank you.